So Deepa, let's start with our webinar and uh, let's start with the basics first. So can you tell us uh, what is effective fundraising? First and foremost, thank you, Parul, for that lovely uh, introduction. And uh, hello to everyone out there today. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so it's wonderful to be here. And uh, hopefully the next uh, hour or so, uh, you know, I'm able to contribute something meaningful and uh, you have some takeaways which would help you in your fundraising. Um, so Parul, uh, you know, in terms of effective fundraising, let me actually affect, uh, actually emphasize on first why fundraising is important, right? Um, so what is fundraising and why is it core to what uh, the programs and the wonderful programs that you highlighted uh, on the ground for these organizations, right? So fundraising is essentially an integral part of uh, any function. If you're not able to raise funds, you cannot maintain your impact. A, you might be able to kind of demonstrate an impact initially with your own funds. But if you are not able to raise it, then you are not able to maintain that uh, impact on ground as well as if you engage it uh, better with the donors, you're actually able to even grow your impact in most cases. So always think of fundraising as a partnership or a relationship with the donors uh, rather than in a very transactional uh, manner that they are able to give you money. Um, so that, you know, having emphasized that, I would say there are three key elements of effective fundraising. One is pitch. When I say pitch, it means what is your value proposition, all right? What is it that you are enabling or transforming on ground? And why are you better than the innumerable not-for-profits out there? I think that value proposition should come very, very clearly in your pitch. Uh, the second element of fundraising, as I kind of alluded to before, is partnerships. Think of these as relationship building and partnerships to enable you to do your work better on ground and not just as a transactional kind of uh, element. And the third and most important, of course, which we will delve a little bit deeper as we go ahead is the strategy piece. Um, it has to be thought out. It has to be flexible. It has to be agile, especially in terms of these trying times in COVID. Uh, where you need to ensure that you have the agility and the flexibility to kind of modify your strategy and what will it take you or what kind of strategy will take you there. Yeah. Thank you so much for elaborating on this Deepa and widening our lens around effective fundraising. Uh, taking from your third point on uh, having a strategy, um, my next question to you is, what are those key points an organization should be ready with to start fundraising? So, um, so Parul, I think, you know, even before we start to think about strategy per se, I think we need to ensure that some of the basics uh, that I covered are also kind of very, very clear and aligned, right? Are you able to communicate what you do in three minutes? And what are the key elements that a donor essentially looks at, right? So when I said pitch, a pitch is an umbrella term again, but what does, what are these elements that need to be absolutely cleared and more so because all of you, as you had explained earlier, are early stage organizations. I think there are about six elements again, and it helps when you think of it as numbers, right? And simple, basic answers that you need to have. First is why, right? Why are you in the space A? And why did you choose to focus on education, livelihood, health, whatever the cause may be? So I think the why part should be absolutely clear. The second uh, W I would say is the what. What are you trying to achieve? What change are you planning to bring in this, uh, you know, in the universe that you are uh, aspiring to work on? The third will be around who. Who are you targeting? Girl children, uh, children, elderly, uh, youths, so, you know, and why these people and why not someone else, right? And even geography for that matter. Some people work in tribal areas, some people rural, some people urban. So the why, the what, the where, or sorry, the who, and then where we address, and then how. How is essentially, you know, what is your theory of change, right? And what is that approach? How are you approaching to tackle this problem? And what is so unique about your approach, again, I keep coming back because donors are inundated with multiple NGOs that approach them. 
So you have to be absolutely clear what is your unique value proposition here that you are making this change, right? So the how part needs to be clear. The sixth element is how much. And this is extremely important because you need to understand how much are you spending per unit to bring about a change. Uh, so if you have these elements covered in the form of a storytelling or in the form of a story and whatever form or shape you wish to take, it could be an elevator pitch in three minutes or it could be a detailed presentation. But the key elements of the pitch are around these, the basics of why, what, who, how, where and how much. Right. And that how much is it justified? Is it efficient enough? to bring that change on the ground that you are envisioning. So that pitch portion is a kind of a precursor for you to actually get absolutely clear that this is how I want to go about with my fundraising, right? The second aspect of, uh, you know, a strategy or any, before we even get into that part is credibility. Uh, you know, a lot of donors, like again, I said, get approached by multiple NGOs. So of course, you know, what you work, the impact on ground, absolutely essential. But who are you backed? You know, who is backing you? Who are your board of advisors? Who is your on your legal board? Who are your core donors if you have already built one or two uh, at this stage in, uh, of your organization? And transparency accountability, right? Um, have you made your audited financials transparent in the public domain? Are you Credibility Alliance certified or GuideStar certified? So I think these elements are have to be absolutely in place before you begin your fundraising strategy, so to say. So I would just pause here and uh, see if Parul wants to take any more questions. Yeah. Um. Thank you so much for elaborating on those points. And I think uh, these points are very valuable, especially for early stage organizations. And uh, definitely, I think even we, when we go out to raise funds now, we will definitely keep these points in mind, you know, while creating a strategy. Uh, so thanks a lot uh, for sharing those points. Uh, so while creating a strategy would definitely be the first step towards effective fundraising. Mm -hmm. What should an organization keep in mind uh, to devise a sustainable fundraising strategy? And how can an organization achieve this kind of sustainability? Thanks for that question. That is actually the meat of the uh, <laughs> session today. And I'm going to put you all at work also with this uh, question in a way. Uh, but before I do that, let me just kind of um, explain to you what, when we say strategy, right, what, what are the elements of that strategy again, right? Um, I think the core elements, again, have to be, of course, at the top is what is your fundraising goal and what is a realistic annual budget? And that actually stems from the point around once you know how much you need to create an impact on ground. And uh, let me also make sure that you know, whenever you create or that unit change, right, or the cost per unit, I think it's very, very imperative that you also include some portion of your overhead costs. It is not just programmatic costs, but also include some of your um, support function cost as an apportion cost to that unit of change. It's a, extremely important to do that and the donors do understand it. So you, there's no need for you to go again and raise unrestricted funds or whatever if there is project specific funding that comes in. A. The second is once you know how much is that unit cost and how many, straightforward is multiplication, right? And you get your organization budget uh, overall uh, with some 20% buffer may be added in for institution building costs and maybe other, uh, you know, unforeseen uh, kind of contingency costs that you could add. So once that fundraising uh, budget for the organization is in place, make sure it's realistic enough for you to achieve that. And uh, you have the capacity within your team to actually execute that on ground as well, right? So that is the first step is the realistic goal of what my uh, annual budget of my organization is, should be. And that is kind of a budgeting exercise that you should go through. The second is, uh, you know, having a timeline or time frame in mind as well of when you would like to spend time to raise uh, money. Uh, given the stage of your uh, most of your participant, uh, the organizations that are participating, um, my suggestion would be spend about 20% of the 
co-founder or the founders or the CEO, the senior level time in fundraising. Um, I don't think, you know, having a separate fundraising resource at your stage of organization would make any uh, sense at this point in time. So keeping that, that you have to allocate 20% of your time on fundraising. And at the end of the day, um, you are the idea and the soul behind what you're trying to achieve on the ground and no better person to actually go and ask for funds than you actually, you may not like it, uh, but I think it's important and essential that you actually step in to see what takes you uh, to your goal even further, right? Um, so having said that, uh, the, the essential elements of uh, fundraising are, and I would like to make this an activity workshop kind of thing. And if we are able to spend about 10 minutes, I think it will go a long way. Uh, Parul, correct me if I'm wrong, but most NGOs uh, participating today are in the annual budget of about uh, 30 to 50 lakhs. Uh, yes. Right. Great. So uh, uh, can I share my screen here? I'm going to share my screen. Are you able to see it? Yes. So, um, so essentially what the goal here, I would like you, uh, hopefully this is more action oriented and it is something that will be useful as you walk away, uh, you know, uh, towards the end of the session today is what can be my approach to fundraising. And I would encourage if you have a pen and paper with you uh, guys uh, to pick this up and do this as an activity with me. Um, so essentially what is extremely essential and will help you build a sustainable fundraising strategy is a balanced portfolio, right? So one of the things that is extremely important that is there are various sources of fundraising. Uh, there is, of course, government uh, funding that comes in. The second could be CSR, the Corporate Social Responsibility Initiatives across different uh, corporates. There are high net worth individuals. Uh, when I say high net worth individuals, these are individuals who can say give you anywhere between uh, one to 10 lakhs uh, per annum type of folks. Um, you have retail uh, givers who can give you anywhere from say 500 rupees to 5,000 rupees, uh, most, most of them online giving. Then in some cases like livelihoods or education, even depending on your model, you may have some revenue source with respect to earned income. And of course you have uh, international, uh, you know, whether it's private foundations or multilateral agencies. So if you look at these different sources of funding, your goal should be to create a very, very balanced mix here. And given that you guys are very, very early stage at this point, um, I would emphasize, you know, the, for the purposes of this workshop or this kind of activity today to focus more around uh, the CSR high net worth and retail piece. So um, the earned income and the multilateral or the international uh, funding today, I'm assuming it could be 0%. So I would like to request, uh, you know, all of you to take a minute and kind of, if you are able to draw out a matrix or a pie chart of similar nature, what is it looking like today uh, for, you, for your organization? And some of it might be very straightforward given your uh, budget. And most likely either it is bootstrapped or uh, you know, most CSR or very few individual donors. And where is it that you would like to take this forward with? So take a minute and uh, kind of see what is the shape of your pie looking like um, in terms of the allocations from different sources and where is it from a balanced portfolio um, that you would like to go for yeah and i would also like to emphasize here see there is no one right or wrong answer it also depends on what kind of leads sources you have and what your model is uh, in terms of um, uh, you know, uh, the model on ground, the operational model, which may lend itself naturally to uh, one, uh, one type of uh, source vis-a-vis -vis the other. Yeah. Now, once you have that in place, what, and like I said, I think for the purposes of this conversation, I'm going to focus more around uh, CSR, HNIs, and the retail kind of thing. 
uh, there is a certain percentage we can allocate to government, but this is just to kind of say that if your fundraising target is a crore uh, or, you know, that's where you would like to get to. And if my, uh, you know, the example one that I shared, if we were to take that, where essentially my CSR ideal state um, portfolio for fundraising is, uh, or funding is essentially saying that 25% or 25 lakhs um, comes from CSR. Uh, the high net worth individuals and the retail make up my balance 50%. What this enables us to do if we have this kind of a mix is essentially say that um, we are not, um, we are hedging our risks, right? We are not dependent on one single donor uh, as much and are able to, uh, you know, have the agility and flexibility because it's individuals to go after many more. Um, CSRs, as you guys are, uh, must actually be aware already that, especially in terms of COVID, there is a huge dip I think we are going to see in the next 12 to 18 months with respect to uh, CSR bef before hopefully it picks up again. Um, the general trend that we have seen in the past and by experience is this average ticket size. Um, what we know is HNIs can give you anywhere from 1 to 10 lakhs per annum, depending on the um, uh, giving potential of these high net worth individuals, as we call it. But let's assume for purposes of simplicity that um, a high net worth individual can give you around 2 lakhs. A CSR, if you're tapping into it and given the lead time, you shouldn't go for anything less than 5 lakhs with them. And retail uh, donors are probably around, say, 3,000 uh, average uh, ticket size of uh, sort, right? 3,000 to 5,000 is generally the average ticket size here. So what is the number of people that you need to get your goal? So if you assume the average donation size as such, then you essentially need about, um, you know, five people to get to your goal of 25. 15 HNIs to get to your goal of 30 lakhs and about 600 plus or 700 retail uh, givers to get to that particular goal. So given this scenario and uh, what we have seen again from experience is the conversion ratio, uh, which I mean uh, when I say conversion ratio, you need to meet at least four times the number of people or your proposals should reach at least four times the number of people um, to convert one person right so essentially you meet four people one person actually uh, converts into the csr uh, giving is uh, what we have seen and the lead time to csr is also anywhere from three to six months depending on their budget cycles uh, for h and i's on the other hand what we have seen is the conversion ratio is much better because typically you would approach a high net worth individual, um, uh, you know, via a warm connect or via sources that are known to you uh, rather than uh, cold calling in any form or manner or just reaching out and writing on proposals. So the conversion rate typically is three is to one or two is to one type thing. So every two or three people you meet, generally you get a conversion of one. If, of course, like I said, the precursors are in order, wherein your value proposition is clear and uh, your budget also makes sense from uh, implementation on ground. Uh, retail, however, really varies. Um, but if you're reaching out to your family, friends, volunteers, connects, it could be anywhere from 10 to 20. Uh, and I've taken a slightly optimistic scenario here with respect to retail. So it essentially means that you will need so many leads or prospects in order to meet that goal. Right? Now, again, uh, I would request for you guys to take a minute and see if you were to raise and for simplicity's sake, if given your fundraising budget or your annual budget of the organization, what is this matrix going to look like for you? And one of the important things here is um, as you approach donors for uh, fundraising, um, ensure that um, uh, you know, you have a flexibility with respect to, you know, uh, the product itself. So you generally tend to say, you know, you have the certain number of units if possible, uh, again, depending on the model, operating model on ground. But I'm assuming given most of you are grassroots, you will have that unit cost per model. And uh, this is what it uh, 
kind of, if you were to, you know, this is what five lakhs or 10 lakhs would help support. Yeah. So now that you've generated or you know that you need to generate so many leads or prospects, how are you going to get there? I think that's the fundamental question that is going on in everybody's minds at this moment. So there are various channels and approaches to achieve this goal. And this is a one-time exercise. Once you do it, then it's, uh, this is what your ultimately your strategy is going to be, right? So assuming that we need at least 6,000 plus leads on retail with the goal of 20 lakhs to raise, who are you going to approach, right? So this, this is the circle of influence piece. And I think it's very important that you um, look at this very carefully. There is no ma magical wand to fundraising. This is a more structured approach to actually seek out and don't hesitate to ask. At the end of the day, it's, um, you're not asking for yourself, but it is for the work on the ground that you are doing, right? Um, so immediate family, friends, colleagues, volunteer staff, corporate payroll givers, um, if you have any CSR, tap into that kind of network for the retail uh, giving. Again, uh, via whom? All of these folks. When, right? Uh, people generally tend to give, especially when it is retail giving in terms of occasions, right? Their anniversaries, their birthdays, in memory of someone, um, uh, Diwali, you know, different seasons um, that come up for US and uh, international donors. It's generally around Christmas time or Thanksgiving time. Uh, but India, again, you know, there's enough, again, tax saving, right? March is the month that people generally give to ensure that they get the tax breaks and the tax benefits. So use these occasions to kind of um, uh, tap into your retail base and ask because there is a reason to ask when these occasions come about, right? And uh, where, right? And what are these platforms? You know, first and foremost, I think most of you should have a website. If you have a website, there should be a very prominent donate button with your own payment gateway. Um, with, you know, especially in case of online scenarios, this is the ideal way to do. Uh, you only incur the transaction cost uh, that is required on that payment gateway. Um, the second one is crowdfunding platforms, right, which run enormous number of campaigns or have their own funding base that they reach out to, uh, all of that. Um, the third is, you know, if, you know, when you grow certain, I think, size, this would be more uh, applicable, which is direct calling or telemarketing kind of thing. And the last one, like I said, is more around corporate payroll giving. So these are your channels, essentially, if you're able to create um, three or four interesting campaigns, figure out when would you like to run these campaigns. And then it's a week or two weeks of concerted effort to reach out to this base, creating this base of people um, who subscribe to your network, who are your family, friends, uh, colleagues, and, you know, and you know, lo and behold, I'm sure you will be able to create a database of easily 1,000 plus, 2,000 plus to begin with, and you keep adding on to that network, right? The second is h &I. So where do you find these h &Is, right? So who are h &Is? Who are these high net worth individuals who can give uh, 2 lakhs to 10 lakhs per annum? These are typically, um, you know, CXOs of various companies, uh, CEOs, COOs, uh, CFOs, who are earning generally in, a, in the range of a crore plus per annum. They could be partners in a PVC law firm. They could be even small and medium enterprises in your uh, local areas, right? So these are the people who have that potential to give you that two to 10 lakhs per annum. And how do you tap into it? I think the biggest and foremost here is engaging your board very thoroughly. Um, which is where the board uh, role is not just from a credibility point of view, but also they should be your champion. They should believe in your cause, not only give to you, but also be able to provide you with some leads for the same, right? And that's why the composition of an advisory board becomes very, very important for you. And who, and it could be existing donors, it could be families. And this is something I would encourage uh, you to do on an ongoing basis because of the various networks that you might, uh, you know, interact with, whether it's NGO or your incubator um, networks, 
uh, or is it uh, you know with respect to your uh, board or any other events that you may have what we have found from our experience is uh, one is to one or a face to face interaction goes a long way um, but given these uh, times of uh, you know uh, virtual uh, ask and fundraising and work uh, to some extent uh, you know virtually in the zoom call or a skype call does make a lot of sense more so if they are people that who have been connected via your family or a board which is what we call as a warm connect so they introduce them the second method in uh, times when it is quite um, you know hopefully in 6 months or a year down the line when things normalize a little bit uh, what we have also seen happen successfully in the past is um, generally when a uh, when one of your champion uh, is not very comfortable introducing you one on one uh we request if uh, they can actually host a small high tea or a small event at their homes right um where it is a very informal gathering of say 5 to 7 folks and let them uh you know invite you as a person to introduce uh with no uh, explicit ask per se but just to know uh, you know what um, what you are up to what is the work that you are doing and it makes for an interesting chat and a conversation in an evening um what it lends you is actually a credibility or an endorsement by this champion uh hopefully you are able to kind of speak to the people around the five seven folks and you know you have your lead list of about five seven people that you can actually later on uh, write and kind of seek meetings to talk about your work in person um the third uh, thing we've also seen is giving circles uh which are again uh you know you create a circle or a project uh, it could be from a crowd on a crowd funding platform or it could be something again via your hni network where you have raised a certain portion you say 50000 contribution or a 1 lakh and 10 people come together to say support a school or uh, support a center so there are different ways and means in which you can think through some of these things and uh, normally we have also seen that people do give to uh, gap funding more often the third uh, aspect is csr this is going to be a difficult task for the from the current scenario but nevertheless i think it's important for you to think about how to build this as a base of uh, you know revenue for uh, your fundraising um what you can do is again the important thing is creating a lead list of sorts uh do your secondary research figure out which uh, companies uh, via your ngo network or via uh, you know google search and secondary research who are the likely people to fund for your cause right talk to your incubator network most of you have already been incubated of course with edumentum but also i believe other um, similar uh, folks understand who are the likely people that are will that could be uh, interested in uh, giving you money right or looking at you talk to your board go to them with a lead list tell them you know these are the people that we think um, uh, you know kind of would be interested are there folks that you could help us connect with uh, the fourth thing is events right uh, there are csr boxes there we really go through the annual reports of uh, um, these uh, you know these um, the company see what kind of uh, giving they do what kind of causes they support there is some amount of leg work that will be required here the last one is with respect to uh, you know events there are i think quite a few events that happen in the ecosystem today um, see where is it that you are able to showcase your work uh, where is it that you are able to um, you know even network with people who are present in the room uh, be it csr event or there are anthropic events and multiple uh, so on and so forth right um, again the most effective way of fundraising is a warm connect uh, having a one is to one uh, face to face um, kind of uh, interaction if possible uh, this if that is not possible then an informal gathering where you still meet about it's a closed room kind of thing but five to seven people and the last would be in terms of uh, uh, you know a request for proposal and going uh, bottom up type thing so i would pause here and uh, kind of um, uh, you know kind of let you guys take a minute again to see if there is something that uh, you can create uh, with respect to or something triggers 
with respect to which are the people that you can approach and how you can engage your uh, board and other people that you know in your network very effectively. Yes. Um, thank you so much for detailing out these external factors that are so relevant to fundraising activities. The funding ecosystem is so vast and diverse in itself, and there are innumerable opportunities learning lurking in every corner. Mm -hmm. In order for organizations to tap into these opportunities, uh, should fundraising be an inbuilt activity within the whole organization? Or should we have dedicated team towards working uh, towards the strategy? Right, right. Um, so honestly, uh, Parul, given, uh, so it all depends on the stage of your organization, right? Currently, if your budget is about 50 lakhs to a crore, um, and like I said, no better person to tell a story or tell your story than the founders uh, themselves. And at this stage, I think if the founders or the senior uh, people in the team spend 20% of their time on fundraising, that is more than enough. Uh, so once you cross about, say, a crore um, in terms of your budget, uh, then it makes sense to look at a person to hire, um, you know, most likely a, a, you know, a junior level person who can help you with proposal writing, follow ups and all of that. Uh, but honestly, you will never be able to get away from, uh, you know, not fundraising it yourself. I think to some extent, till you get to a sizable uh, number, which is around say five or 10 crores, the, as founders or as the senior leadership, you will need to be involved yourself. And it's extremely essential that you carve out at least 20% of your time on fundraising. Thank you so much. Uh, and I think it definitely depends on every organization's budget. Uh, yeah. and what amount they are uh, looking forward to raise. Um, so definitely, this is a very yeah. valuable insight. And, and it also needs to be cost effective, right? For your size of the organization, does it make sense or are you better off uh, doing it by yourself? And how efficient can you be in your fundraising? I think that's a very important uh, aspect to also consider. Yes. Thank you. Um, Coming on to the next question, um, so this is uh, one of the most asked questions uh, from organizations, especially in the early stages, is what, uh, and the question is, uh, what approaches should one adopt when reaching out to potential funders in different verticals like CSR, philanthropic foundations, HNIs, and if you can highlight what makes them take interest in an organization? Right, right. So, um, so fundamentally, uh, you know, it keeps coming back to the basics, essentially, uh, whether it is CSR or uh, HNIs or philanthropic foundations, I think the most important element is your passion, right, which is where there is no better fundraiser than uh, the founders themselves, honestly. Uh, so you need to tell your story uh, in a very, very heartfelt manner as to why are you here, right? the basics that we alluded to early on is why are you doing what you're doing? The articulation of why, what, where, who, how and how much has to be extremely clear. The second piece is around, uh, you know, what they look for is how are you tracking your outcomes, right? You may not have an extensive m &E in place and nobody expects it honestly, right? At this stage in your uh, organization as you're starting off. But what is important is are you tracking this, right? What are those indicators that you're looking to understand whether your work is making a difference on the ground? Uh, how are you able to verify those on the ground? And what is it that you envision, uh, you know, uh, from a feedback from the ground perspective to kind of close that loop, which will feed into your say three year plan or a five year plan. Um, again, it's more around the horizon rather than being fixated on numbers per se, but how are you envisioning a change on ground, say three years or five years? I think your passion, your articulation of uh, what and how you're doing it, how are you tracking your outcomes? Uh, if these three things are covered, and like I said, in whatever form or manner, it could be an elevator pitch, you know, talking one-on-one -on -one or via a presentation, whatever the case may be, these elements become extremely um, essential to kind of uh, communicate. And that's what uh, appeals to people. 
thank you for sharing these points and i think these are very valuable points and the fundamental points of uh, you know uh, re approaching a, a potential funder so thanks a lot for highlighting them uh before we open the floor for questions from the audience uh i'd like to ask you a question which is not particularly limited to early stage organizations the question is um uh, how do we create a sustainable environment for donor relation retention mm -hmm. according to you in what ways can we manage positive donor relations so as you have seen actually the acquisition cost and the strategy that we just went through right the activity is actually quite intensive so if you have done so much leg work to actually acquire uh, the donors it's extremely important i'm glad you asked that question parun uh, because it's extremely important to retain them and the retention is always 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 cheaper than actually acquisition or acquiring the donors and what are the ways in which you can do that uh, you know you don't need to go for anything fancy honestly right i think fundamentally a warm thank you letter on the receipt of you know post your meeting uh, or uh, after receiving the funds be prompt with follow ups right if you have done a meeting they have asked you certain questions certain uh, proposal uh, clarifications get back to them uh, acknowledging you know if there if there's going to be a delay acknowledge that and get back to them with a timeline of sorts once they become your donors um, you know the receipts the thank you letters uh, need to go a personalized email keeping them posted on what's happening on ground rather than the newsletter format actually goes a long way once a quarter i think more than enough uh, to kind of keep them engaged and like i said try to make an attempt to meet some of these high net worth or csr uh, point of contacts that you may have at least once a year if not twice a year Uh, where you go not only to update them with respect to how things are progressing along but also to see how can they be they play a part in your growth journey as well um for the retail piece of things if you are focusing around the retail uh, aspect of things then definitely a newsletter or even uh, you know same communication email that you send as a personalized note can be put in the form of a mailing list and sent to these uh, retail donors Uh, again once in 3 months at least and uh, yeah i think there are multiple ways in which you can again engage a retail donor but these small things go a long way in uh, retaining your uh, key donors at least thanks a lot uh, thank you for sharing your insights on such small and actionable steps to manage positive donor relations um definitely it will it, it these are very helpful Uh, and now we would like to open the floor for questions from our audience um i request you all to write your questions in the q and a box and we will take them up one by one so we already have quite a few questions over here uh, deepa uh the first question is uh with the new fcra amendments being released what are your suggestions for non profits to keep in mind while we raise right. funds right um honestly which is oops. Uh, which is why i didn't uh, focus today much on uh, international uh, donations is because of this new fcr amendment right i think fundamentally there's enough and more happening domestic philanthropy is uh, kind of waking up and uh, quite active as well i must say so it is uh, i think you can given the stage of your organizations first you can raise your money uh, or your budget from uh, with domestic philanthropy but nevertheless if you do wish to go for uh, you know the international private donation private uh, foundations or the multilateral agencies the fundamental thing to keep in mind with respect to the amendment is essentially that you are not going to be able to sub grant it so you have to be the one who are actually implementing it on ground uh, unfortunately uh, the new fcra amendment doesn't allow for collaboration on projects with respect to that all right so you have to be able to demonstrate the ability and have the cap capability and the capacity to implement it yourself on ground a uh, b is i think there is an overhead cap uh, that has been instituted uh, initially it used to be 50% and now it has been reduced to 20% and there are certain line items similar to how the csr mandates as to what constitutes this overhead and that is something you need to be um, cognizant about uh, when you do submit uh the third is of course you know uh, goes without saying even earlier i think you need to be 
extremely and you should need you need to ensure that you are completely compliant with the fcra norms and uh, your filings and uh, ensure every quarter your filings are updated on the mha site and all of that um, and apart from that i think creating the uh, account in sbi delhi branch has uh, made it quite difficult so uh, we'll wait to see what the repercussions of that on ground are but fundamentally, I think, yeah, you need to ensure that you need to have the capability to implement yourself on the ground. Thank you. Uh, our next question is, um, what can be learned from nonprofits in the grassroots with no specific teams or specialists doing effective fundraising? So um, honestly, I think, like I said, what makes for a good uh, fundraising or effective fundraising is, ensuring you have your act correct, right? Uh, what you're doing on ground and uh, um, hopefully, uh, you know, being incubated by Edumentum or such um, uh, other uh, incubators also ensures that you have your uh, theory of change, your approach, uh, your focus, uh, you know, the vision, all of that kind of aligned uh, to actually uh, get it done, right? And uh, post that, uh, you know, you can uh, ensure that uh, you have your uh, portfolio as balanced as possible. And you are in actually a very good stage because you don't have, to, you can build and get to that kind of uh, stage slowly while initially you may be bootstrapping it yourself but take your time to build good boards so what we have seen in the past with effective uh, not-for-profits at an early stage is they are able to tap into the networks um, very very strongly they don't hesitate to ask and that is very imperative thank you um our next question is, uh, please share some of the interesting donor, donor relation activities you have come across. Um, uh, so there are many actually. So a uh, couple of things and I would like to uh, maybe invite my uh, co-founder Manisha is also online if she would like to share some of that as well. Uh, but some of the things, uh, like I said, uh, small things are around uh, inviting your donors to uh, visit right to do a field visit or a project visit and uh, there's nothing uh, you know uh, like actually seeing is better than actually just reading it on paper right and if you're able to convince your uh, donor to actually come and make a field visit or bring a friend along right i think that goes a long way um, so when you speak to your uh, champion or board member encourage them to get one friend or two couple of friends uh, along to actually come and visit you on your project site. That's a very interesting thing. And we have seen 100% conversions uh, when people tend to do that, right? Uh, the second is, um, you know, instituting day of caring, especially with CSRs. Uh, and, you know, if you want to engage with their uh, employees of uh, CSRs, suggest a day of caring at their, uh, at the corporate office. Uh, what that day of caring means is actually, again, getting them to kind of uh, celebrate uh, what the work that you are doing, either by giving you an audience uh, in their, uh, say, you know, town hall meetings uh, or, uh, you know, a larger audience where you can speak to them, uh, you know, one on one almost or uh, getting them to actually do a field visit again. Um, and I cannot emphasize the importance of getting people on the field and people do like it. Um, but you need to structure it also very smartly so that uh, there are takeaways and there are debriefings that happen post that and there is a way for you to connect and follow up post that uh, visit. Apart from that, uh, you know, you have your usual um, hampers and thank you um, things that you send, uh, you know, towards the new year or Diwali. Uh, but some of those do uh, cost money. Um, so if you're able to afford that from your budget, I think it is a good way. Uh, but I don't think uh, that makes a very, very big uh, difference. Thank you. Um, our next question is, uh, how does CSR Box help in funding? Yeah. So, uh, so CSR Box is a platform. So you can actually log into uh, their uh, website. You can create a login. It allows you to post projects. Uh, it allows you to actually scout for uh, CSRs which are looking for projects and what their budget is. Uh, they also have a, uh, I think, an annual event, if I'm not wrong, 
uh, where they, uh, you know, a lot of CSRs do uh, come in and participate. Uh, so you can see how you can actually, um, uh, you know, attend those uh, events. Uh, and uh, also, uh, they also publish an annual report of the spend of the CSR, so which will again give you a sense of uh, what's uh, happening uh, in different CSRs, what is the spend, what are the cause areas of interest. So if you're able to tap into that, it uh, helps. But that's, it's essentially a platform that you can log in and uh, kind of uh, do it. I don't know if they offer one-on-one -on -one assistance to NGOs. I, I, I've not explored that. I, I think they also recently had an online uh, uh, CSR uh, event. Correct. If I'm not wrong. Yeah. Correct. Um, see. Uh, uh, so moving on to our next question, uh, it is: When do you know you should? When do you know you should redistribute goals across portfolios if CSR isn't the brightest star at the moment? If I had planned to raise fifty percent of a fifty lakh budget, for example. So, um, so again, it depends on say, it's a good question actually. So I think the, uh, normally CSRs, you will enter into an MOU with respect to their uh, renewals, right? And these are typically one year uh, period or maybe max of three years. Uh, that's what I've seen how CSR generally function. So if you know that you are due for renewal in another six months, you should actually seek out the person of contact uh, at the CSR organization and check how things are, which is where that face-to-face -face meeting uh, twice a year is actually extremely valuable to maintain that relationship and connect um, and understand whether, you know, at least get feelers of whether they are going to uh, continue or renew the funding or uh, is it going to be dropped. Uh, in all likelihood, with the COVID scenarios, um, you know, there is diverse, I mean, uh, the funds are being diverted to PM care, CM cares, and COVID related efforts. And um, given that scenario, either you are going to experience a reduction or complete, uh, you know, elimination. So six months is a good enough time period for you to then actually take a call and uh, figure out who are my possible other donors that I need to hedge this risk against, right? And which is why it's extremely important that when you accept money as much as possible and why you may be tempted that this one donor is giving me 10 lakhs, 20 lakhs. Uh, if your budget is 50 lakhs, uh, try, try your best not to get more than 20% of your funding from a single donor. Because tomorrow, if this donor goes away, you are going to be in big trouble. And you need to have that buffer enough to actually tide over that period so that you're able to cover that 20% or 25% from other sources. Hope that answers the question, yeah. Thank you for answering this question, Deepa. Uh, our next question is, uh, how do we decrease the follow-up calls? How do we decrease the follow-up calls with respect to uh, you can't decrease. <laughs> uh, but uh, generally, uh, what we have seen uh, work efficiently, which is where it's extremely important to go top down when possible, uh, be it CSR or, and the, you know, the, the, the reason individuals work is because the decision making is quick, right? It's an individual that makes a decision, whether it's high net worth or retail, Kind of thing but with CSR it's usually a committee and a, a bunch of people that is why you might be better off targeting small to medium enterprises who have uh, you know a soul or maybe two decision makers at max and you're fairly quick on that uh, or the second option is uh, actually trying to see uh, you know uh, what uh, uh, you know with respect to seeing that go top down essentially, uh, so which is where your, the way of connect becomes very important. If you're going bottom up, I don't think there's any end to follow up because honestly it has to get approved and there is a layer and layer after that before actually the decision gets made. So the lead time uh, for any CSR is essentially three to six months and I don't think it will go below that. But for a high net worth individual, the lead time can be anywhere from one to three months uh, because the decision making, like I said, is quick. Um, generally, the rule of thumb is three follow-ups at a minimum it does take. 
um, and what we call essentially a nudge, right? And then nudge is required for everyone given that, uh, you know, there are so many other priorities that people have. Um, so you need to ensure that you're able to get your, um, uh, you know, ask also up on top of people's minds. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, our next question is uh, by Putul and uh, she's asking, it is important to build a strong uh, recall value for a non-profit so that more and more people consider donating. But spending money on advertising feels like cheating the actual cause. Is there a way to raise funds for fundraising activities or what is a solution to this? Again, um, like I said, I think you have to be very careful, effective, efficient in terms of fundraising. Um, tend to agree with you uh, with respect to advertising, um, unless people are able to give it to you pro bono, um, you know, uh, then it makes complete sense. Go for it. Right. Uh, but honestly, brand recall is required when you're looking at raising huge sums of money uh, with respect to retail. Right. Uh, if you're going with a high net worth donor or a CSR kind of thing, uh, then honestly, it's a one on one peer ask, which actually makes the biggest difference. So their brand recall is not as much important as the work that you're doing on the ground. Um, the second piece, if you're focusing around uh, retail uh, and, uh, you know, and that also, uh, you know, slowly you need to build your base around that. Um, there are multiple methods of, uh, and I'm not an expert, I'll be very honest, I'm not an expert on retail fundraising, but a brand recall is essentially required at that point in time um, to ensure that more people recognize you and uh, do it. So uh, my two cents on this is, I am with you, I don't think, don't go overboard with advertising at this point in time. If there are Google AdWords and simple tricks that can do the, with the SEO uh, kind of of uh, modifications uh, or the Facebook, uh, you know, grants that are given out, uh, go for it. Uh, but otherwise, uh, at this point, I think get, uh, stabilize your fundraising core uh, before you start thinking about brand recall and other things. Thank you. Uh, so because we're almost nearing to the end of our session, we'll take this one last question. Sure. Uh, the question is, what would you recommend uh, is the single most important marketing strategy that would go hand in hand with, with fundraising? Marketing strategy is, um, again, um, I can't emphasize enough about storytelling here, right? I think that is the biggest um, fund marketing strategy. Um, storytelling, but with substance. Right. Uh, there has to be depth in your uh, storytelling. Um, I have seen NGOs who actually, you know, cannot even speak a word of English, honestly, uh, but are able to move hearts because, uh, you know, they have demonstrated why they are doing what they are doing and how have they been able to affect lives. So there is no better marketing strategy than actually demonstrating what you have done on ground and how effectively that you tell your story from the heart. Um, that goes a long way than any other marketing uh, gimmick, honestly speaking. So I'll, yeah, I think that's in a, you know, that is the most effective marketing strategy, according to me. Great, thank you so much, Deepa. Um, and that brings us uh, to the end of this really insightful, detailed and action-oriented webinar on the effective ways to fundraise. Deepa, on behalf of Team Mantra for Change, Edumentum, and the many organizations that have joined us today on both Zoom and Facebook, I would like to thank you for sharing this space with us and providing us with some really great ideas on getting our fundraising strategies off the ground. Given the climate we are in today, it's extremely important for us to keep having these dialogues that would tremendously benefit organizations, whether they're early stage or mature. I would also like to thank all our audience for joining us this evening and listening to Deepa's insights. If you wish to reach out to her for more information, you can write to us on the email ID displayed on your screen. We will also be sharing the video with all of you shortly. Um, hope you all had a wonderful time here today. Thank you once again for joining us and have a great evening. Thank you.